Our chapel speaker today is Dr. John Hanna, research professor and distinguished professor of historical theology. Dr. Hanna has uh, served on the DTS faculty since 1971. In fact, he was my first prof in historical theology, but we were very young in those days. <laughs> His teaching interests include the overall history of the Christian Church, with particular interest in the works of Jonathan Edwards and John Owen. His publications include books and journal articles, chapters in books, audio materials, and computerized works. He has recently completed researching and writing a history of Dallas Seminary and continues work on a history of the Christian Church. John remains active in church ministries and serves on the boards of several organizations. He's a frequent and popular church and conference speaker, both in the United States and abroad. Dr. Hannah's wife, Carolyn, who I believe is here today, and we welcome Carolyn as well. Carolyn is the advisor for the Seminary Wives and Ministry Program here at DTS. They have two married daughters and six grandchildren. And I would like you to join with me in welcoming my friend and colleague, Dr. John Hanna. Thank you. The first week that we gathered for this semester, our president uh, spoke to us from the mission statement of our institution, and he chose in it uh, a phrase, and that phrase was uh, godly servant leaders. What I would like to do in the few moments we have is to think together practically about another phrase in our mission statement, and that is to glorify God. <coughs> what exactly does that mean? as far as we can tell, how do you analyze it and apply that concept to your life and to my life? The mission statement of our institution goes something like this. The mission of Dallas Theological Seminary, a professional graduate level school, is to glorify God by equipping godly servant leaders for the proclamation of His Word and for the building up of the body of Christ worldwide. It seems to me that in life, there are only a few questions. And among those questions are, why, what, how, and so what? The question of what is a philosophical question of existence. We will avoid that. <laughs> the question of why focuses upon the issue of cause of that existence. How deals with method, and so what deals with implication. Of these four questions, although there are others, I would like to focus upon two. I do that because two of them are without dispute as to meaning. What is simply answered this way. When you separate the transient and impermanent from the eternal and permanent, your duty and my duty is the same. However we organize our existential existence, it is to glorify God. Why is also easy to answer. Why are we to glorify Him? The simple answer is, an all-wise, incomprehensible being has ordered it. And since he is beyond human knowledge and superb in all of his ways, we have no right as creatures to debate it or modify it. We are here to glorify God. We are here because 
He fundamentally has commanded it. Now, if I had a text for what I would like to use as a launching pad for my thoughts, it would be the end of Romans chapter 11. If you're aware of that little paragraph that begins in verse 33 and ends in verse 36, it is the culmination of an argument by the apostle that leaves him absolutely astounded. Uh, you can catch the emotional gravity of the apostle's words even in translation when he says, oh and how. At the end of the argument, beginning perhaps in chapter 9, in which he raises the question about his faithfulness to his covenant people. And God unfolds the majesty of his eternal plan for the ancient people and how they interact with the new people of God. Paul is fundamentally left breathless. And he says this, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable are his ways. For who has been, who has known the mind of God? Who has been his counselor? Who can give to him that he might be repaid again? And he ends by four of him, through him, and to him be the glory forever. Amen. I observe several things. He first focuses upon God's character. He says, Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The point, I think, is the immensity of the wisdom of God. Then he says, how unsearchable are his judgments, the profundity of his ways, his judgments, his decisions. How unfathomable are his ways. He is incomprehensible. He is beyond the creature. But he has stooped in condescension to the creature. And then he poses three questions. Who has known the mind of the Lord? His wisdom is simply of a different variety, quality, than ours. So this is fairly clear to me. Who has become his counselor? Who has taken him aside to inform him of a better way to go? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? God is unilateral. God is non-reciprocal. He is full of generosity without cause, but with decided discrimination. And the last verse of this little section gives us the reason. Four, because all things find their origin in him. Second, all things are sustained by him. And third, all things find their goal in him. Simply stated, God is the first cause. God is the sustaining cause. And God is the final cause. So, what I would like to do is extract a thought from this text to launch into a discussion of another thought. 
captured here is the reason not concerning us today, but certainly it provides a valuable lens for us to use today. By implication, this text brings us to the third and fourth questions. Not what, not why, but how, and so what. The how presents us with a ponderous question. How do I glorify a God who is supremely omnipotent, self-existent, absolutely needing nothing, unimprovable, and completely complete? I can add nothing to him. I can subtract nothing from him. He is the eternally self-existent God of the heavens. This is the question I think we all have, questions, when we finish our academic preparation for the ministry. We sit down with ourselves and say, self, what didn't I get? What did I not hear? Obviously, what did I actually miss when it was told to me? And one of the questions among several that I felt inadequate to answer was the question, given the propensity and self-sufficiency of God, given my explicit duty to glorify Him, what does that mean? And how does it work? If you look at our passage, it says, oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable his ways. Simply put, God is beyond discovering. In verse 34, he says, who has known the mind of the Lord? He is beyond knowing. Who has been his counselor? He is beyond informing. Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? He is beyond improving. And the reason is verse 36, because he owns everything. And there is nothing he does not possess. He is the one who gives. He is the one who sustains. He is the one beyond all others. So the question becomes this. As a person who has come to know this God, through the mercies and benevolencies of Christ in condescending grace to make me begin to become what I shall someday be. What does it mean to glorify God? Given the assumptions I've laid out so far, I think the way to address this issue is to pose some questions. And the first question is this. These are rather mundane. Why did God create the world? I think the simple answer is because he wanted to. Psalm 19, we all know, gives us a potential clue. The heavens declare the glory of God and the earth shows his handiwork. It's a silent book that reflects upon the perfections of its creator. He did it for his glory. 
He did it so he could see himself in all his beauty. And in verse 36 of our passage, we learn something clear. All that he has done, he has done for himself. Second question, why did he create humankind? I think the answer to that question is the answer to the first question, because he wanted to. He made man, according to the Hebrews, for a little while, lower than the angels, and crowned them with glory. But now we see Jesus, the Hebraist says. He made us for himself. He made us so that when he beholds what he has made, he can see himself in that creation. For God is only glorified by himself. So he made the starry host. He made the complexity of the human brain. He made our lives so that, simply put, he could see himself in you. Now, how can God show himself forth in the creature? Since we have only a blighted twistedness of him within us. And I think the clue, if we're using our text, is verse 35. Who can give to him in order that he may be paid back again? The point is simply, you and I can give him nothing. Nothing equals his glory. You and I also know something schizophrenic about Christianity. And if you're not a wee bit schizophrenic, Christianity becomes difficult. And that is this. What God requires, God gives. What he asks of us, he provides and causes. For the simple fact that he wants no glory to be given to the creature. Ancillarily, obviously, we are blessed. As the old saying goes, when mama in the kitchen is happy, the whole house is happy. Now, what has he given us so that you and I might reflect his character so that he might behold his beauty? The simple answer to that question is this. He has given us himself. In what sense has he given us himself? He gave us his spirit, called the Holy Spirit, who has come to reside in us while our Lord is absent from us. Now we come to a question. If the means whereby glorifying God is the gift of eternal life as reflected in the gift of the Spirit of God, what does it mean that the Spirit of God indwells us? What is the Spirit's manner of existence within us? It is obviously non-material, for he is spirit. It is spiritual in nature. It is not a cube. It is not an area that exists within my existence physically. Since it is immaterial and invisible, it can only be discerned by its effects. 
So what is the dwelling of the Spirit? How do I discern that? The answer is by its fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, I know it's an exegetically debatable verse, without punctuation in the original that our exegetes and scholars have uh, provided. And how they punctuate it determines how it is read. We will not go there. <laughs> Honer is here. <laughs> I'm trying to be serious. However it is read, whether it is read, the fruit of the Spirit is love with eight qualifying characteristics of love. Or it is read, the fruit of the Spirit is a concophony of concepts, including nine. When you're done with it, the end is, the manner of the indwelling of the Spirit is manifested morally. What God seeks, he gives. That we can give back what he seeks of us. What does God seek of you and me and us? He seeks to see himself. He seeks to see what he gave you because he expects nothing of you, self-generated, to equal his glory. Now we come to the last question. So what? What does all of this practically mean for us? Here it is. Please listen. Life is not, goals are not about intellectual achievement. God is a bit wiser than we are. Let's not flaunt his gifts to us as though they are ours. They're on loan. We wither and perish, but not changeth thee. It is not about financial success. It is not about academic success. We are not discussing what is important. We are discussing what is ultimate and what is subservient to the ultimate and final goal. It is not about the size of a home, the size of a ministry, or the size of a family. It is not about ethnicity or nationhood. It is not about one station in life. All of those things that we avariously pursue are external things. They're a means. They're not the end. And if there's a characteristic of humankind that I have found is we make the mistake of not understanding secondary cause and primary end, and we confuse the two. It's really all about internal qualities. When God looks at you, does he see love? Or does he see a person avariously pursuing self-advancement under the cloak of the glory of God? Does he see joy? Or are you a walking storm cloud 
gifted with the gift of criticism. Have you found peace? If you put peace off until you graduate, you will never find it. Because peace is not about circumstances. It's about a person that rises above our circumstances. To glorify God simply means, does God see himself as reflective of his life through the Spirit in your life? Does God see himself in your attitudes, in your actions, in your motives? Does he see himself in the relationship to the lady or man you made promises to? Does he see it in your studies? Does he see it in your children? Now I end with a challenge. And the challenge is just this. When you lay your weary head upon your pillow tonight, fearful of picking up the remnants of the chaos you left behind in the morning, I want you to ask him a question. Not about what you did, but ask him this question. Did you see yourself in me today? Did you see love? Or did you see territorial self-preservation? Did you see joy? Did you see yourself? When you rise tomorrow morning, I want you to ask God a question. Would you allow me today to so live my life that you might see yourself and you will glorify God? Thank you, Father, for this great text of Holy Scripture. Help us in our lives, in the myriad and cacophony of information available to us to sort out what is first, what is second, what is third. Bless these, your children. Bless this faculty. Bless our school. Help us to exude the qualities of the Spirit of God that God may be pleased and we know he will when he sees himself whom he loves in his children. Amen.